I'm going to present some new evidence that Margaret Fuller, the transcendentalist, was not, as historians believe, the author signing as a star or single asterisk in the New York Tribune from December of 1844 through August of 1846. I'm going to have to go by my notes. It's a little bit awkward. Um, let me just say that, uh, first of all, for those of you that only watched the first minute or two minutes or five minutes of my videos, these are designed as like court cases that I'm presenting. This is evidence. If you don't see all the evidence, then you can't judge whether I uh, was able to prove the case or not. And, you know, you wouldn't want a jury to only hear five minutes of testimony against you, you know. So uh, it's like that. Now... Um, historians also claim that Margaret Fuller was signing with the letter F for Fuller in the Dial, the Transcendentalist magazine, the Dial, which she was editing the first couple years. That was not her. That was Matthew Franklin Whittier signing with his middle initial F. He had used F as early as July 1831 in the New England magazine, and he had used the star or single asterisk as early as 1829 in the Boston Courier, and he continued to use both of these off and on long after Margaret Fuller's death in 1850. What she did was not to publicly claim these things. She mentioned it like in a footnote in private correspondence to one or two people like one of her brothers and a couple of her friends. You know, there's one instance I found where she just kind of casually mentions that she was F in the, uh, you know, signing as F. And, and what she says is that she was the writer that wrote the very first article in the dial, um, a short essay on critics. Uh, and so she mentions that, that that was hers, along with one of the other ones. It was not hers. That was Matthew Franklin Whittier, who, after Ralph Waldo Emerson's introduction, wrote the first article that was ever published in the dial. And then she mentions it in a couple letters, just like in a footnote, you know, in passing. Oh, yes, by the way, I was the star, you know. And I, apparently the pattern is that she was just trying to impress her friends and her relatives. That's all. It wasn't anything she dared say publicly until 1846. Now, in 1845, she had published Woman in the 19th Century through her editor, Horace Greeley at the Tribune. He had published that for her. But in 1846, she decided she was going to publish a compilation of what was supposedly her published works in different sources. And she didn't go to Horace Greeley because apparently she was having a falling out with his partner, Thomas McElrath, who was the business manager. And I think that they knew or would have known that Matthew was the author of at least half the material that she was going to publish in this compilation, which was called Papers on Literature and Art. See, so she went to Wiley and Putnam, who didn't know anything about it, and they published it in July of 1846. Well, I think Matthew got wind of this in mid-May 1846, a couple months before and he quit. I'm sure he just quit right on the spot in disgust that Margaret Fuller, because she let the rumor develop, see, but she she had never publicly said that she was the author of these pieces. Well, that's, you know, her business if she wants to let people think whatever they want to think. Of course, Matthew didn't know she was privately mentioning this to people in correspondence. But in 1846, she's literally publishing his work as her own, and he got disgusted and he quit the paper. Uh, but he had material on file. So there's a bunch of book reviews that probably were still on file. But the last one that he ever wrote about anything that was going on in New York City at the time had to do with a concert at Castle Garden. It's called the Grand Festival Concert at Castle Garden. That was the May uh, 22nd, 1846 edition of the Tribune. But before we go into that, let's look to see what when the rumor developed, because apparently, as near as I can tell, that rumor that Margaret Fuller was the author of The Star didn't develop until March of 1846, quite late. Up until that time, everybody thought that it was a man, see? So at least we have proof that at least as of July 3rd, 1845, somebody thought it was a man. That much I can prove. 
And this had to do with an article Matthew had written about Swedenborgianism, about Emanuel Swedenborg's church. And uh, he was very much an admirer of Swedenborg, but he wasn't so big on the church. And, and near as I can tell, Matthew actually had been involved in that organization and got disillusioned with the organization, and that's why he wrote in that vein. As of 1842, he defended Swedenborg, but I think he got fed up with the church because it was too, it, it thought of itself as the orthodoxy, see, and he didn't have much use for orthodoxies. So somebody responded to that, uh, to the first uh, review about uh, books about Swedenborg and the organization. This person was signing with a, a bold capital C or a crescent moon. It's kind of hard to pick out what it is. But he says, permit me to notice a few things which I find on the first page of the Tribune for last Wednesday in an article entitled Swedenborgianism, reviewing some new church books and signed, and he has an asterisk or star. First, let me express to you and the reviewer my sincere thanks for that article, and especially for the high and merited praise therein bestowed on Swedenborg, who has said Matthew still admired. Most heartily do I thank the writer for his bold and manly independence and for the true courage that he has displayed in daring to speak as he has, etc. So, as of July 3rd, this person clearly thought that the star was a man. Now, whether he had any inside knowledge or not, you know, because Matthew had been involved in that organization, he might very well have known who it was. But uh, we don't have any proof of that. But we know that the rumor was not out that Margaret Fuller was the star as of July 3rd, 1845. When the rumor developed, as near as I can tell, was in March 4, 1846, Matthew reviewed a book that was in favor of capital punishment, which Matthew very definitely was not. And um, so he panned that book. And then um, on March 10, he follows up and he's responding to somebody who had written in the New York Courier and Inquirer. So uh, the person in the Inquirer had said, Matthew quotes him, Of course, no reply will be made to that very modest lady who so foolishly and with so much vanity suffered herself to be thrust forward in an argument for which she admits she has neither skill nor patience. So he's very condescending. Well, Matthew responded, and he had to respond to this person's condescending treatment of women. And at the same time, he had to leave it open, at least in, in a coded reference, that, that it wasn't a woman, actually. See, so he, But he couldn't come right out and say that. So what he did was uh, the following, March 10, 1846. Matthew's quite sarcastic, which he was a satirist, so he could do that. Though, however, we are now informed that there are minds so penetrated with the spirit of chivalry that they cannot regard a woman as an adversary, we should not advise the band of, quote, heroic philanthropists censured in the courier and inquirer, meaning himself, for seeking to protect themselves behind the veil and parasol of this mistaken Clorinda to regard them as secure, etc., etc., etc. Well, that's a reference to a poem, and a Clorinda is basically an Amazon, and the poem was the guy couldn't fight this woman because she was a woman and he fell in love with her and so on. So it's a reference to somebody else's poetry. Um, but what he's saying is that you can take it two ways. You can take it that the Clorinda was mistaken, that would be the automatic assumption, or you can take it that it was a mistake to think it was a Clorinda, and that's the little ambiguity that Matthew wanted to leave for posterity, just as a little marker so that we knew that actually it was not Margaret Fuller. But this is where that rumor started. And then Matthew, other than this little coded reference, Matthew didn't come out and straighten it out. So the rumor started to grow that Margaret Fuller was the star. And then by 1846, it was assumed that she was, and she went ahead and published all of Matthew's star side work as her own. So that's how this thing developed. But we've got a clue because, as I said earlier, in the May 22nd, 1846 edition, this is probably the last thing that Matthew ever wrote for the Tribune as the star, the Grand Festival Concert at Castle Garden. 
in that review, Matthew tells us, kind of in an offhand way, he gives this little personal anecdote. Well, he very rarely did that, and if he did it, very often it was code, just like the mistaken Clorinda. It was intended to give posterity a clue. Well, nobody else has picked up on it except me, his reincarnation. Okay, I had to come back to pick up on his own clues. So what he says is, never, never shall we forget one night when Bram, B-R-A-H-A-M, was giving forth the sublime remains of his great voice, such tones as none of us will hear again in Luther's judgment hymn, while he was calling upon the trumpets to answer and the dead to arise, the ladies and gentlemen arose instead and began shawling and cloaking, lest they should lose the best moment for going out. That was in Boston. So, um, it's ironic, you know, it's satirical, and that's typical of Matthew's use of irony and satire. But he's given us a historical reference, okay? So now the gauntlet is thrown. Uh, if we can find that concert, can we prove whether or not Margaret Fuller attended it or could have attended it? Well, I brought it that close, and now what I'm going to do is show you. Any of you who have watched the first five minutes are missing the entire piece of evidence, okay? Because I had to give the background for that. Now, it so happens this concert was given by a famous British tenor named John Bram, who was kind of toward the end of his career. This was his American tour in 1840-41, uh, the winter of 1840 and 41. Someone else, I believe Tuckerman, uh, actually reviewed this in the dial. Uh, not this particular concert, but uh, the winter concerts in Boston, including Bram. So this concert ended with the judgment hymn. So we know we've got the right one because none of the other ones did. I found the announcements for just about all of them. It was at the Melodeon Theater in Boston, downtown Boston. It, it uh, started at 7 p.m. on the evening of January 31st, 1841. So now the question is, did Margaret Fuller attend? Is there any historical evidence that Margaret Fuller either did or didn't attend that concert? So again, we've got it this close. Now, in Margaret Fuller's diary, uh, the day before the concert, January 30, she writes, I am going away a day or two to be with men. This is the third time I have done so this month from the restlessness of pain. Now, she talks about how she was sick all that month. She had nervous headaches. She was getting bleeding treatments. They were bleeding her for this, and it wasn't helping. So apparently three times that month, she went away to be with men. We don't know what she means by that. I do know that she had been to see Ralph Waldo Emerson give a talk on the 25th and had visited her friend Carolyn Sturgis on the 24th to get tickets. So uh, she had been around. Uh, what she means by being with men, we don't know. It seems to have something to do with curing her nervous headaches. That's as much as I will say. Um, however, uh, I also know that, um, that if she was going to see a concert, she would mention it in correspondence to her friend, William Ellery Channing. I have two examples of that. Uh, she does so on December 8th. She mentions having attended a concert. That was December 8th, 1840, the previous December and then on April 5th, she mentions having seen a Beethoven concert. So anytime she saw a concert, she would tell, especially if it was just recently. So she writes to William Ellery Channing on February 2nd, two days after the concert, which was on the 31st. And she doesn't mention seeing any concerts in Boston. So that's very suspicious. Had she seen the concert with John Bram on the 31st, she would almost for sure have mentioned it in her February 2nd letter to Channing, okay? And then she has said in her diary that she's going to be away for a day or two. So we have a gap of January 31st, the night of the concert, and February 1st, where she said she was going to be away. There's no diary entries. There's no letters that I have found of those two days. There's a big gap. And then on the 2nd, she writes to Channing, and she doesn't mention that she's been to any concerts. So I wouldn't say that this is 100% proof, but I would say it's like 98% proof. I think it would hold up in a court of law that Margaret Fuller was not in town. She was not in Boston in the evening of January 31st. 
she did not attend that concert, okay? But the star said, Never, never shall we forget one night when Bram was giving forth the sublime remains of his great voice, such tones as none of us will hear again in Luther's judgment hymn, while he was calling upon the trumpets to answer and the dead to arise, the ladies and gentlemen arose instead and began shawling and cloaking, lest they should lose the best moment for going out that was in Boston. Therefore, 98% definite, Margaret Fuller did not write that. Therefore, Margaret Fuller did not write all the star-signed articles and reviews and reports in the New York Daily Tribune from December 1844 through August 1846. I think she wrote a few short ones. I think she modified Matthew's writings, stuck in her own paragraph sometimes when she felt like it. And I think she wrote the last two or three in August. And the final one, which is like a send-off where she says goodbye to everybody, she's leaving for Europe, that had to have been her. The rest of it is all Matthew Franklin Whittier. That means that when she published papers on literature and art, in 1846 in July, uh, she published, you know, what was it, 11 pieces by Matthew from the Tribune. That wasn't hers. She's a massive plagiarist, okay? So I don't know what kind of adjustments this is going to have to require for people to wrap their minds around the fact that this icon that they've been preaching about in the Unitarian Universalist churches, you know, uh, that she was a, a phony and a, a massive plagiarist, but that's what you have here. And that's, I have to expose her because I have to reclaim Matthew Franklin Whittier's legacy. So uh, I have to wrest it away from these phonies.